Hi, everybody. This is uh, Pete Irig from Island Community Church, and welcome to part nine of the life of Paul. Uh, this week, we're going to be going over Colossians, the letter to the Colossians. So um, just to recap, the whole point of these series is that everybody can get better at scripture, at interpreting scripture. What we're trying to do is give you background, context, and tools to help you better do your own uh, studies of scripture or participate in Bible study groups. So what I'm trying to do is give you the context of the letters and and Paul's life so it brings it to life and it gives you a, a little bit more background that you can uh, better approach uh, the study of scripture. So, so far we've seen that Paul, uh, just as a recap, his biography, he was born in Tarsus, which is an Asian minor, about 5 BC. Father was a Roman citizen. He was educated as a Pharisee, that's a big deal. Encountered Christ uh, as a Pharisee, uh, changed his life, converted to, to uh, be the apostle to the Gentiles throughout the Roman Empire. Uh, he was stoned, arrested, shipwrecked, you name it. Eventually was shipped to Rome for trial and was probably executed in around 66 AD. Uh, I think one of the key points with, that we've been harping on is that he was a Roman citizen at a time when people from the provinces were not Roman citizens. So it was kind of unique, and he claimed that right at various points, uh, which was very important. As a Jew, uh, there was a lot of different groups. He was obviously uh, trained as a Pharisee, um, and that gave him a lot of credibility as he went around the Roman Empire and started preaching in synagogues. If they knew he was a Pharisee, that was a big deal. Uh, as an apostle, he became the apostle to the Gentiles. Uh, he almost uh, single-handedly went around uh, in, through three missionary journeys and extended stays in various cities and towns, uh, started churches all over the place, and uh, kept in communication with them, which is where we get his letters from. Uh, of course, everywhere he went, he was in conflict. Uh, he was in conflict with the Jews once they figured out what he was preaching. The pagans, uh, was that was a completely different mindset. The Romans saw him ultimately as a troublemaker. And what he would call the Judaizers or uh, other Christian teachers that would come behind him and try to convince some of the early churches that, no, you have to, you have to uh, convert to Judaism in order to follow Christ. And Paul fought against that his entire ministry. We, uh, after we did the biography, we talked uh, a bit about each of the epistles, which is a fancy Greek term for a letter. Uh, we said that Paul's writings and writings about him make up about a third of the New Testament. So that's pretty important. Most of the letters that we have from Paul are what we call occasional letters. There's some background, some context, or some occasion that caused him to write the letter. And that's what we're trying to explore in each of these to, to make sure you understand that. We looked at the letter to the Romans, which is what I call the Mount Everest of Paul's letters. It's, uh, it's long, it's uh, very detailed. It really gives an account of the gospel that he preached. And of course, uh, also addressed some topical things, some conflicts within the Roman church wasn't his church. Peter started the, the Roman church. So when he wrote that letter, he had never been to Rome. And, and so he was writing to a church that wasn't one that he started. As opposed to the next letter we looked at was the, the letter to the Corinthians. Uh, the, this church in Corinth was one that he started and, and shepherd. Uh, that letter and those two letters are really to correct the attitudes in the church and provide some practical pastoral guidance to them of how do you live in a fallen, broken world as a Christian? How do you relate to each other? So when I we talked about the letter of Romans, I said when you when you read Romans, you get a picture of the what I call the contemplative Paul. He's taking his time. He's laying out a, a very uh, thorough argument for the gospel. Uh, First and Second Corinthians is what I would call the pastor Paul. This is. Paul as the shepherd and pastor of these early churches and trying to write to them and, and correct them and counsel them and give them practical guidance of how to live out the gospel. Galatians is Paul the stern father or Paul with his hair on fire. You know, he saw that the Galatians were getting um, 
talked to by these Judaizer teachers that came behind Paul. Paul started the church churches in Galatia, and uh, he he heard that they were um, considering they had to go get circumcised and follow all the rules of the Torah. And it just he's like, what don't you remember what I told you? And so that that's a kind of a crisis management ma management letter. Uh, Philemon uh, is what I would say Paul is a friend coworker. This is his most personal letter, um, and it was a plea to Philemon, who's the the master of uh, Onesimus, who was the runaway slave that Paul converted to Christianity. And he's sending Philemon, uh, uh, Onesimus back to Philemon uh, to say, hey, you know, he's now your brother. Please accept him. And so that's a very short letter, but a very personal letter, very humble letter. This week, we're going to look at Colossians. And I would say that this is, when you read Colossians, you get a picture of Paul as a guard against worldly doctrines. And we'll, we'll talk about what that means here in a second. So just as a recap, Colossae was kind of a backwater town in Asia Minor. You can see on this map, it's, it's not too far from Ephesus, but it was, it was out of the way. Paul had actually had never really been to Colossae. He had uh, obviously known people uh, who lived there, who maybe he met when he was in Ephesus or in Rome. Um, he he uh, converted people who then went and, and started churches in some of these smaller towns. So you'll see in the letter that he actually mentions that I've never met you people in, in person, but he feels a, uh, a real responsibility for that church. So the occasion of the letter to the Colossians uh, is, is, is pretty straightforward because he, he pretty much says it in the letter. He wrote this, he's one of his prison letters, probably when he was under house arrest or, or in prison in Rome in about 60 AD. And it was delivered, we think, along with the letter to Philemon, because within the Colossians letter, Onesimus is mentioned again. So uh, we think that, you know, the Philemon was a personal letter, whereas this letter to the church at Colossae was what we call a circular letter. And what that means is it's a letter, yes, it's addressed to one church, but it's meant to be passed around for all the local churches in the local area. So uh, he does mention in there that he wants this passed to the church also in Laodicea. Uh, Laodicea is uh, an, about a ten, another little town in Asia Minor, about 10 miles away from Colossae. And again, Paul had never been to Laodicea. Um, but in Colossians 4.16, he says, after this letter has been read to you, see that it also is read in the church of, of the Lacodiceans and that you in turn read the letter from Lacodicea. Now, so he's saying, pass this letter to the Lacodiceans and also read the letter I wrote to them. We don't have that letter, unfortunately. Um, so we know that there was a letter he wrote. He wrote lots of letters. We have what we have. That's what the Holy Spirit uh, has uh, given us. Um, so Paul had never been to Colossae or Lacodicea. Uh, he's, he mentions that Epaphras uh, was working under Paul, who I guess we, we assume that Paul converted Epaphras, and then Epaphras went and started the church in Colossae. So in, in Colossians 2, 1, he says, I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those at Laodicea, uh, Laodicea and, all, and for all who have not met me personally. So obviously he's met the, the leaders. He probably met them in Ephesus or in his various journeys, but he had never been to those towns. Paul had heard from Epaphras and others about false teachers in Colossae. So again, the, this whole thing about false teachers and, and Judaizers is again a constant theme in, in Paul, and he's constantly trying to go back and make sure that the early, the, these first churches uh, stay the course, stay the, the course in the gospel that, that Paul uh, preached to them. So Paul uses this letter to the Colossians uh, to refute the false teachers and also to provide some theological and pastoral guidance as well. So you, it's not only a, a great 
uh, way to kind of understand why the gospel needs to be pure, but also it gives you some practical advice as you read through the text uh, about how to relate to each other, what your roles are, things like that. So let's talk about more, since that's the occasion of false teaching in Colossae, that's why he wrote this letter. Let's talk about that. So when you look at the letter, um, it's got probably the, the, the most extensive treatment of the supremacy of Christ that Paul gives in any of his letters. Um, that's really your, your first section beyond the introduction of Thanksgiving. So he bases all the guidance that he gives to Colossae on the supremacy of Christ. And so in Colossians, uh, in first section of Colossians, he, he writes, um, the sun is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Uh, for in him, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So, you know, it, he is preaching that it all is about Christ. Do not listen to anything else other than the gospel as, as what we've told you about Christ. And he, Christ is the Lord of all. So don't think that someone else has secret knowledge that I didn't tell you. Uh, the interesting thing about this passage, I, I would note, is that the, it's a very sim similar theme to the prologue of the Gospel of John, when, when John talks about the Logos, which is Jesus, and all things were made through, for him, through him, and he's been existent since the very beginning of the universe, and, and th through all times, so he's eternal. So it's interesting that both of those are very similar themes. Remember that this was probably written, Colossians was written in about 60 AD. Uh, we think that the Gospel of John, most scholars will say it's around 70 AD, or maybe just a little bit before, some date a little later. Um, but I, I tend to think it's probably about 69, 70 um, AD for the Gospel of John. That means there's probably about 10 or 15 years between when Paul wrote this letter and when the Gospel of John was written down. And what it shows is that, again, if you think about uh, Christ was crucified in 33 AD, you've got a, a good a couple decades of these these gospel teachings have been oral, and so it's not like John copied Paul. These are things that were the common Orthodox gospel that all the apostles were teaching, and so they were just written down. So I, I think that's a very interesting point that there's, uh, it's, it's consistent, it's orthodox teaching consistent even across time in these various apostles. Uh, and he starts giving us hints about what the false teaching is. Now he never really comes out and exactly describes who these people are. So you, you know, scholars are still, still have theories and you have to do detective work and kind of connect the dots. So in Colossians 2.4, he says, I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine sounding arguments. So people kind of, scholars and commentators kind of think, all right, so there's probably some people in there that are using philosophical arguments, maybe some Greek philosophy being mixed in with the gospel. And so uh, Paul's telling them, listen, don't, you know, these people will come out with a lot of intellectual theories, maybe kind of change the gospel. Don't, don't listen to that. In uh, Colossians 2.8, he, he writes, uh, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow, deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. Again, probably a reference to some teachers that are, have invaded the Colossian church and are taking stuff from maybe Greek philosophy or even Jewish philosophy and changing the gospel, you know, mixing in philosophy with the gospel. And Paul doesn't want them to have any, any part of it. In uh, Colossians 2.16, he writes, therefore do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or, or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration or a Sabbath day. This is probably, again, a, a 
reference to the Judaizers, right? So you, you know, you had to keep kosher if you were a Jew. You couldn't eat meat from, um, you know, that was not kosher. You wouldn't eat things that were uh, sacrificed in a pagan temple. You would have to keep all of the religious and ceremonial rules about, you know, what you could do on the Sabbath, what you couldn't do, just like a Jew. And so this is probably against the Judaizers, the people that would come behind Paul and tell them, oh yeah, well, Paul gave you that gospel. He's, he's right, but he left out a bunch of stuff. Like one of the most important things is you now have to become an observant Jew to follow Jesus. So you have to get circumcised, eat kosher, follow all the Torah, you know, the whole religious festival. And Paul's like, no, no, it doesn't matter. The only thing that matters now is Christ. Uh, and in Colossians uh, 2.20 and uh, 2.21, uh, he writes, since you died with Christ to the elemental forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? And those rules are, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Like all these, these rules about food and cleanliness and, and uh uh, spiritual purity having to do with rules and following sets of rules that's that doesn't apply to us anymore you know christ did away with all that you are just all one in christ and that is again strictly right against the the judaizers what he would call the judaizers that that went to practically every one of his uh the churches that he he found either founded either directly or indirectly he, he kept fighting against that for his entire ministry and you see that throughout his letters we saw it especially like in galatians that's another uh occasion where he is directly refuting that um that influence so uh let's i think the background what i'd like to kind of concentrate this week on for this letter is really about this heresy and false teaching. Um, and you can kind of split it into two parts, and, and I did here. So the first part would be what we would call the apostolic age. This is when, after Christ's uh, uh, crucifixion and resurrection, um, the, he commissioned the apostles and, and the followers to spread the gospel and create disciples across the world. And so that age would be from 33 AD, say, when uh, Christ was risen, to about 90 AD, which is when we think that the last apostle died, which was John probably in Ephesus. So after that, there were no more apostles because they, they had all been martyred in one. John was the only one not to be martyred. He, he died as an old man in Ephesus. And so we don't have, the only real uh, direct evidence we have for what these heresies and false teachings were are really the letters of Paul and Acts and some, some other things in the New Testament. We don't have any other early Christian writings from that time that directly tell us what these are. So you have to kind of take each writing in the New Testament and tease out of it and, and create a picture. So one thing that we do know, especially from the letters of Paul, was there was this huge conflict in the very early church, and we saw it um, uh, highlighted in Galatians. We saw it; you see, can see it in Acts, where the church, the very the very first uh, believers, had to kind of sort out: Do you have to be a Jew to follow Christ or not? And is the gospel for the Jews? Well, obviously. Uh, through the Council in Jerusalem, the apostles decided, yes, it's for the Gentiles as well, the gospel. And Paul was given the green light to go ahead and preach to the, to the Gentiles throughout the empire. But there were still people going around telling people, no, you have to, you have to convert to be an Orthodox Jew to follow Christ in the real way. And that was uh, certainly something that, that Paul was directly fighting against. So that's certainly one false teaching that was in circulation. Another one would be uh, pagan beliefs in gods, idols, and sacrifices. So think about if you're a pagan, if you're a Gentile somewhere in the Roman Empire, and Paul is converting you and uh, preaching the gospel, and you come to Christ and say you're in Corinth, and he starts the church in Corinth, 
remember we talked about Corinth was the Las Vegas of the ancient world. So you're, and Paul goes away after a, a time and you're, you've got a little house church and you're still living in a pagan society. You've got all these influences every day about, you know, their beliefs in gods and idols and sacrifices and temples and things like that. Uh, it could be easy, uh, especially as a very new believer, to get those things to influence you, to, to kind of seep into your thinking, into your way of life into your understanding of what the gospel is. And certainly Paul and others were having to fight against that. Uh, another one would be the Greek philosophies. You know, you had various schools of philosophy at Stoicism and um, Epicureanism and you know, Plato, Socrates and Plato and Zeno and all these Greek philosophers, which were very big in the Greek and Roman empire. And if you were an educated person, you know, you would be educated in those philosophies and again some of those philosophies could infiltrate the gospel and it start uh you know modifying your thinking and maybe your way of life and again that was something and that's we think that colossians paul is talking about a little bit of that of you know these these people who have all these great intellectual arguments about how the world works and and they're trying to change the gospel don't listen to them um, there were also many, many different little mystery cults, and some not so little, some big, uh, that would come out of Egypt or the East, the Persian Empire, and, and uh, the, the Roman writers of the ancient world would lament sometimes, they'd say, you know, every stupid cult eventually comes to Rome. And so, you know, you walk down the street and there's always some kind of mystery cult doing something behind a closed door. Now, ironically, the early Roman writers thought that Christianity was just one, one more of those cults. It's like, I don't know what this thing came, came from Judea. I don't know what they do. They meet in secret in the woods. And who knows what they do? So there were a lot of uh, uh, influences from different mystery cults and, and uh, from Egypt and things like that. The last one uh, is something called Gnosticism. Uh, that that's a fancy word. It comes from the Greek word uh, gnosis, which is just means knowledge. And these were people um, that taught uh, or they believed a form of the gospel that said, you know, there's the gospel, the public gospel, the one probably that Paul's talking about and Peter, but there's a secret gospel. There's secret knowledge that only the true believers know. And it's really about this duality in the universe and you know there's the sons of light and sons of darkness and we have secret knowledge that maybe even paul and peter are not telling you and there would be you know these false teachers that would promote some really wacky versions of the gospel uh that um were kind of lumped together and now we call it gnosticism and so it would be secret knowledge cults so Think about it, if you're a brand new Christian in the middle of the Roman Empire, and there's maybe 20 of, 20 of you in the town that you're meet, meeting in a, in a house church, you're still living in this environment of all the stuff floating around intellectually, philosophically, um, all these rituals and, and pagan things. And now you have some false teachers that'll come through town and say, oh, I don't know. I I'll, I know what the real gospel is. Let me tell you about that. And uh, Paul and and all the other apostles and and their followers were constantly trying to make sure that the early churches were not affected by this. And if it looked like they were, they would fire off a letter or go send somebody to help correct um, and get them back on track. So that would be the apostolic age. We don't have outside of the New Testament. We really don't have direct writings about what these are so you have to look at the new testament letters for that now the second period that i would say is the patristic age and that's just uh um comes from the word uh, pater which is uh, greek for father so it's the church fathers if you will so it's the generations right after the apostles it's the followers of the apostles and then through the centuries and that roughly goes from about 90 AD, which is the death of the last apostle, John in Ephesus, 
to about the fall of the Western Roman Empire, 476, 450, depending on what date you want to pick. Now, we do have a lot of early Christian writings in this age, and a majority of it has to do with refuting heresies, because somebody would come, some teacher would come up and then say stuff, and that would spread around the empire, and the church fathers would say, no, that's not what the apostles taught us. This is what it is. And so much of the writings we have from that age uh, are from church fathers fighting heresies and trying to correct and say, no, 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 this is what the gospel is. This is what the apostles taught us about the gospel. And this is what Jesus said, not, not this stuff. And we actually have, uh, there's a lot of different heretics and heresies that, and false teachings uh, through those centuries. Uh, I just want to highlight a couple of the major ones. So there's this guy, Marcion, in about 150 AD, uh, he taught that the God of the Old Testament and Jesus in the New Testament are two different gods. Like there was an Old Testament God and there's a New Testament God. Those are not the same gods. And he actually went and tried to edit uh, Paul's, you know, the Old Testament to kind of make it fit with what he taught. He had a following for a while, and the early church fathers had to kind of fight against that, and they excommunicated him out of the body of believers. Again, there was no Roman Catholic church. There was just the church, and there was no pope. There were just individual bishops of major cities. But these early church fathers would try to fight against these heresies because they would be leading people astray. Um, the next one is something called dos, uh, docetism, which is just from a, a Greek word that means to seem or to appear. So that, that was a, a big heresy that took about 100 years to work through from 100 to 200 AD. And they taught that Jesus only appeared to be human. He wasn't really human. He was God. So anything you saw of him, you know, suffering on the cross, it wasn't really Jesus as a human. It was God. And so he wasn't really man. And so that was a, was a heresy that, that the early church fathers had to kind of fight against. Uh, the next one, uh, if you go forward in time, about 220 AD, Sibelius was a person who taught um, that Jesus and the Father are not distinct, but they're just modes of a single being, meaning there's not three people in the Trinity. It's just one, one person, and, and they just have different modes. And that's not, not the Trinity. And so that was being fought against. Probably the, the biggest one that the early church fathers had to, to, to fight against and one that, that threatened to split the church was this guy Arius in 325 AD. Um, he taught that the Jesus, the son, was created by the father. He was not co-eternal. He was just the first fruits of the universe. So when God created the universe, the first thing he did was create Jesus. And so therefore Jesus is subordinate to the father. He's a, of a lower order and he was created by the father. That's not orthodox. That's not what the, what the scriptures say. Uh, Jesus was always there. He was always co-eternal with the father. Uh, and, and the Trinity said there are three, three persons in the Trinity, co-eternal, um, been there forever. So this Arian uh, heresy really started uh, threatening to split uh, the bodies of believers. So um, that had to be fought against. And the last one uh, I'll just mention is Pelagius, which who was a monk in about 420 AD. And he taught that, you know, um, you can, humans can do good works and that can lead to salvation. You know, he kind of downplayed the grace part of salvation and really said, you can kind of pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. And, and if you do good works and you're a good person, that will lead to your salvation. And he was, uh, he was fought against uh, very, very hard against, say, uh, Augustine, uh, who's one of the late church fathers. So I think that the interesting part of this is these, these and there were many more uh, heresies and false teachings. and to a large degree during this patristic age, uh, 
um, there was something called the rule of faith. And that was kind of basically a, a shorthand for saying, here's what the apostles and the scriptures and the apostles' writings teach. All right, so that's the rule of faith. This is what we believe because this is what Paul said, and this is what Peter said. And if you look at the Gospels, here's what Jesus said. And so there's a rule of faith, if you will, that says if you teach something that's against that, then that's not right. That's a heresy. Most of these, uh, like especially the Arius and the Pelagius, they led to, to the actual church councils where they got all the bishops together you know, from, or all the church leaders together from around the empire, and they would have to sort out, all right, so what is the Trinity? You know, what is our, what are we going to tell all the people? And, and, and it was, it was a, a way to, you know, each one of these heresies would force the early church to really get definite on, all right, here's what this means. You know, here's what the Trinity is. Here's the nature of Jesus. He was God. He was fully man. He's, he wasn't like, didn't seem to be human. He was human. And so basic doctrine like that uh, were, were really as a result and a reaction to some of these heresies uh, that were floating around in the patristic age. So the reason I, I, I think this is important because this is, this, if you go all the way back to Paul's time and he's writing the letter to the Colossians, he, he is refuting false teachers, the very first false teachers and the very first heresies. And he's saying, you know, don't be deceived. Stay with the gospel. Stay with Christ. Believe what I've taught you about the gospel. You know, this is, I'm not preaching some other different gospel. This is the gospel. If anybody preaches a different gospel that's not of Christ, do not believe him and don't get sucked into the world. Don't let the world affect your belief in the gospel. And how you react, relate to each other. Um, so I, I, I thought it was interesting. If you think about it, uh, you know, we're talking about the apostolic age from 33 to 90 AD, and then the uh, patristic age from 90 to say 450 AD. Is false teaching still a problem today? I mean, did they settle all that stuff? you know, 2000 years ago, and we don't have to worry about it. I don't know. You look at the world that we live in. Uh, think about it. We have new age beliefs still are huge, you know, crystals and Ouija boards and uh, animal spirits that you can connect to and meditate and look at your navel and understand the universe. You just go on YouTube or the internet. It's all over the place, right? You have prosperity gospel teachers who kind of pervert the gospel and say, you know, uh, God really wants you to be rich and he wants you to have that Cadillac. And if you send me $24.99 for you know, a pledge, uh, I'll pray for you and you'll get that Cadillac type of thing. Um, you have things like, you know, you, you go on cable TV, you have some really uh, uh, popular shows about paranormal investigators or ghosts and, you know, they go around and they try to connect with the dead and, and it's it's all over the place televangelists obviously all over the television and, and internet uh you still have heresies you know like jehovah's witnesses jehovah's witnesses is the arian uh heresy from from almost 1500 years ago it's the exact same thing they teach that jesus is the first fruit of creation not that he was co-eternal with the father that the father created jesus they even actually have a version of of the scriptures where they where they mistranslate the greek intentionally to make sure that it promotes their their heresies so those some of those heresies that were way back when in the early church are still around they just are called different things and of course many people uh many non-believers and even some that they think they're believers they they think well you know all religions lead to the same place all beliefs kind of it's all the same thing it's all about god and whether you're a buddhist or a hindu or um a christian or whatever or a muslim it doesn't matter it's all the same thing no it's not they claim different things i mean logically that cannot be right you can it you know what we believe is um, 
all religions are true if they, as long as they re, re uh, as long as they agree with Christianity. The, the, the minute they disagree with Christianity, they're wrong. That doesn't mean we're bigots. That's just saying, here's our revealed truth. And we have the revealed truth through Jesus Christ and the scriptures. And, in, and if anything de deviates against that, then it's wrong. And so the world doesn't accept that as generally. Then you have this whole postmodernism philosophy, which basically says, hey, you know, there's no such thing as absolute truth. Christians don't have the absolute truth. Muslims don't. Atheists don't. It, there's no such thing. It, truth is changeable. You have your truth. I've got my truth. You know, that's the way it is. And so when you think about all that stuff, uh, it's not too different than if you were one of the first Christians in Corinth and you're living in this weird society that's got all these different types of beliefs that you're living in every day. How do you not let that affect your belief in the gospel and your walk as a Christian? And so to some degree, it's still, you know, obviously it's still a fallen world. You still have broken human beings and broken thought, and you still have uh, the evil one in the world trying to pervert things as much as, as he can. And so to some degree, it's the same environment that they had back in Paul's time. And it's the same problems. And, but it's the same solution. You, know, you have the teaching of Paul you have what he wrote to the Colossians. So although he wrote it to the Colossians, not to us, he wrote it for us, for all Christians, for all time. And there's just incredible teaching, inspired teaching from God in there about how not to be influenced by all this stuff, how to stay true to the gospel. And that's what's important. So when you think about, to me, the, the importance of the letter of Colossians, uh, it, it, for several reasons. One, Paul gives a real great and incredible extended teaching on the supremacy of Christ. I, I would urge you to meditate on that. Uh, he also provides in this letter, I think, another example of what I would call loving regard for the first churches. Remember, the, the church in Colossae, he had never been to, but he still loved it as one of his children, right? Because it was basically any church whether he directly founded it indirectly or even the church in Rome that he had no part in, uh, he had such tender regard for and, and really looked out for and was trying to do his best to give them the guidance and reinforce the gospel. I think it, uh, Colossians also gives some really practical teaching on how to relate to one another as followers of Christ. Uh, and so there's some great sections in there about that. I think probably one of the main things is that it gives a, a real warning about embracing any of these world's philosophies and fads uh, that will infect your church, will affect your gather, gathering of believers, can affect your understanding of the gospel, can affect what you do in your walk uh, with Christ and how you relate to one another. Uh, I think Paul's warnings and teachings are still relevant absolutely today, uh, as we just talked about. So the recap, as we've said in the series, Paul's one of the most important figures in the apostolic age. He, he went all around the Roman Empire and uh, planted many of those churches and, of course, wrote a big part of the New Testament himself uh, through his letters. Uh, he's the most important the theologian in the early church. Uh, he was the apostle to the Gentiles, had to deal with these Judaizers and false teachers, as we've seen in this uh, overview of the Colossians. And Paul's epistles are foundational for Christian theology. Uh, you always go right back to that and the Gospels to really understand uh, what we believe. Uh, and, and it's inspired by the Holy Spirit, and we are so grateful for it. And so... Next week, I think we will do Ephesians, which is another great uh, uh, epistle. And I hope you are all safe and you are um, using this time to get a little deeper in the Word. I hope this, uh, these recordings help. And until then, we'll see you next week. God bless.